everyone. Thanks for joining us for the uh, Trek Friday seminar Peabot edition, or as I like to call it, the Peabot Lunch and Learn. Uh, today we've got an excellent presentation showing our coordination between two jurisdictions, which I know all of you are very fascinated to hear about the, the interlinkages between. Um, but I do want to say, if you are watching from home, remember you can send in your questions. We'll have time for questions. And for those of you in the audience here, enjoy some of the coffee and treats. I'm sorry, people walking at home, you'll have to come down to PSU to get some of those next time. Uh, our presenters today represent both uh, my employer, Portland Bureau of Transportation, and we have Gabe Graff, who is the head of our Central City of Motion Projects. And from TriMet, we have Kelly Betteridge, formerly Capital Projects Manager and now Project Program Manager for the Project. Yes. Uh, I got that. Uh, so, without any further ado, I think I will pass it to Kelly and Gabe. All right, thank you. I think that I am going to get started. The question and answer period for folks in the room, but, oops. Sorry, maybe this. Click on the screen. Yeah, sorry about that. It's okay. No. I'll try that. All right, there we go. So last week I was waiting for a burrito, as one does, and I picked up the Willamette Week, and the middle column was about kind of what we're going to talk about today. There are lots of opinions expressed in this column, which do not necessarily correlate with my own opinions. However, author does mention on the on the far side that he refers to walking as the kale of transportation and he refers to driving as the bacon of transportation and so my question to you and the first five creative people to answer during the question and answer period to get one of these lovely and durable transit bags is if walking is the kale of transportation and driving is the bacon of transportation then what is transit and why so, I look forward to hearing your creative answers. All right, so we're going to spend a little bit of time today telling you how we're making transit better in the central city. Uh, it's something we've been working on for quite a while, and we're excited to dive into some of the details with you. Um, enhanced transit is actually a really popular topic within the transportation sector. Um, there are a number of our partner agencies that have invested in talk about today. I probably get a call once a month from a partner agency who's interested in developing the type of program that we're talking about today. I want to know our lessons learned and how we went about our process. It's really timely for lots of reasons nationally and here in Portland. A lot of that has to do with the fact that we're growing and we're growing really fast. And while our population is growing, our infrastructure is not. So we really have questions to answer about how we allocate our scarce resource of infrastructure. In addition, many of us are very that pie. And we're really interested in finding ways, innovative ways to reduce that. In addition, while population is growing, unfortunately, we are not seeing a commiserate growth in transit ridership. And so we want to do things as a transit agency, as a city, as a regional government to figure out how we can really move this dial. So one of the many things that we have done over the last couple of years is develop what we call the enhanced transit concept. The idea is that it's a series of tools that can be implemented fairly quickly and fairly inexpensively to improve transit speed and reliability. The idea is that it can be applied at the very micro level. It could be applied to a corridor, but there are a number of things that can be done once you diagnose an issue around reliability and travel time to get to a solution. So the the actual toolbox is large. It has lots of different applications. I sort of think about the toolbox as being divided into two parts. So one part is actually for the jurisdiction who has the ability to make changes in space and time. So the jurisdiction has the ability to decide how we allocate the roadway space, as well as how we allocate the time at the signal. There are a number of ways to improve transit by doing that. 
In addition, the agency has a lot of responsibility about how we can make changes in regard to things like using articulated buses to improve capacity or making policy changes to do things like implementing all door boarding. So all of these tools serve a different purpose and potentially solve different problems, but the intent is to create a robust toolbox that can solve nearly any problem that we identify. While the toolbox is fairly new, these are not new concepts. We've been implementing these in our region and across the country for years. This is an example of one um, project that's been in place for a very long time. This is the approach to the Hawthorne Bridge. We also, of course, have a bat lane on 82nd as you leave the Clackamas Town Center and head north. We're always trying to improve within our system as a transit agency, making tactical changes to stations to optimize locations. So we, we apply these tools all the time, but the intent of this particular program is to really shine a light and to ask our jurisdictional partners to come to the table and deliver these projects more holistically. Um, to answer the why, why is ETC important? So it is taking our buses longer and longer year over year to travel the same distance. And so travel time is important. It's important to all of us. We have a very scarce resource of time. In the short term, the additional time that it takes to travel on a bus has an impact on our quality of life. In the long term, for people that have choices, it often has an impact on how you make a decision on what mode you'll use to take a specific trip. Of course, buses are the workhorse of our system. They carry many, many riders. In some cases, we have bus lines that actually carry even more riders than our rail lines. And these are operating largely in mixed traffic. So any changes that we can affect to improve transit travel time and reliability are seen as big positives for lots of people. And this map is to show that because we have such variability in our travel time between peak and off peak, we really have issues around reliability. And that means that if you want to make sure that you arrive at a specific destination, maybe because you punch a clock, maybe because you need to pick up your kids by five o'clock, you have to allocate more and more time to your trip to make sure that you arrive on time. So about two years ago, um, we were really fortunate and the region allocated TriMet and Metro $5 million to create an enhanced transit concept pilot program. The intent of the program was for us to hire a design team who would then design a whole um, list of projects that could be implemented by the local agency. So we would spend the money on pipelining design on projects and then the local agencies would implement those projects. When we received the money, we started this very data-driven process of identifying how we would prioritize the investments. There are many places in our system that are experiencing issues around reliability and travel time. So essentially what we did was we broke up our entire frequent service network into time point segments, which is about a 10 minute travel time um, segment. And then we ranked each of those segments by three variables, reliability, dwell time, and ridership per mile, so that we could really understand those places in our system with the most riders and the biggest issues with reliability. Once we had, um, gone through the process of ranking all of those segments. We then held a series of 14 workshops with all of our jurisdictional partners in order to talk through the specific issues in their areas and begin to diagnose both the problem with reliability and the types of solution we would need the jurisdiction to bring to the table in order to improve that. So the intent is that we would say, this is where we have a big problem. What we would need from you in an ideal world is a bus lane or to move a station or to let us stop in lane. And then they would respond by the end of that workshop by saying that seems possible or absolutely not, we're not going to do that. So then after we had all of those workshops, which I'll say there was two points to the workshop. Number one was to talk through all of those projects and see what the appetite was. But number two was actually to create sort of a shared understanding of the tools so that all jurisdictional partners across the region understood these are the kinds of things that really improve transit. Maybe you don't wanna apply it to this specific issue that we've identified, but moving forward when you're designing roadways and when you're designing projects, can keep these things in mind because this is what transit needs to be successful. So at the end of those workshops, the jurisdictions applied directly to um, 
Metro, and then the projects were ranked, and then a whole series of projects moved forward into design to take them from concept to design to implementation. And so I'm gonna hand it over to Gabe, who submitted a number of projects within the central city. Thanks, Kelly. Mm -hmm. How's that? We back? All right. Um, so why is the making transit faster, more reliable, particularly critical in our central city um, is what I'll focus on, and also how we integrate it into our central city in motion um, sort of multimodal planning effort. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about what makes the central city a unique context first. Um, you know, it's just 3% of the city of Portland's land area, but where 30% of the uh, population growth is expected to occur. So it's a fast growing, very dense area, the densest concentration of people and jobs in Oregon. Um, home to 30,000 households a day, 130,000 jobs. Um, by 2035, 70,000 households, 180,000 jobs. So how do we move all these new residents and commuters in an already uh, very dense place? Um, and uh, one of those solutions is um, make our roads more efficient, increase the capacity for them to move people. Um, and one great tool for that are um, enhanced transit corridors, bus lanes. Um, I'll note that you know we're not the only fast growing city. Um, a lot of West Coast cities are experiencing this kind of population growth and job growth in their cores. And um, Seattle um, is an example we look to as both sort of a cautionary tale and uh, sort of uh, an opportunity. Um, this is from Commute Seattle. You'll see that they grew uh, 60,000 jobs from 2010 to 2017, and they were able to handle all of that new um, job growth in their downtown core with transit, rideshare, walking, biking, and working from home. And actually, the number of people commuting into downtown Seattle in a single occupancy vehicle for work went down over that period. So uh, we can do that. Um, just um, again, um, the central city, just 3% of Portland's land area, um, but it's 39% streets, 39% public right of way. So part of the premise of our central city in motion effort is um, dedicating more of our, um, more of the central city to road space doesn't make sense. We shouldn't be knocking down buildings and building additional roads. We should just be thinking about how can we make the existing roads we have the most efficient. So um, we went through this planning exercise to figure out where can we um, dedicate additional roadway space to walking, to biking, to buses and max, um, and really, um, increase the people moving capacity of those streets. Um, so this is where we sort of talk about um, how these two efforts integrated. Um, the central city in motion plan um, we worked on in 2017, it was passed by our city council in November of 2018. And it was really focused on making transit faster and more reliable, but also creating a connected and safe bikeway network in our central city and improving pedestrian safety crossings. And those things all work really well together, but in a city like Portland where we have limited and narrow right of way, sometimes they're in conflict, right? You can't fit parking on both sides of the street, two vehicular travel lanes, a protected bike lane, and a bus lane all in the same space. So we tried to look at our central city through a couple of different lenses. Um, and the first lens came directly out of this um, enhanced transit concepts work. So in these orange lines, you'll see those are the streets in our central city where the most transit riders are experiencing the most delay. There's the, it's the, these are the full buses that are stuck in congestion. So those are the sort of the problem areas for getting the most people in and out of our central city um, on the bus. And then at the same time, we're looking at our, on our bikeway network and it's a different context, right? We've got a robust transit service that um, serves our central city hub well, um, but it's stuck in traffic. With biking, it's a different problem where um, we've got good bike connections into the central city, but many cyclists feel like there, are, there isn't a way, a clear, comfortable, safe way to circulate the central city to get to all the destinations they need. So um, we identified um, uh, what would be the backbone of a low stress bikeway network for our central city. And then in, in blue, you see sort of the, the missing pieces that we started to focus on, the, the, the connections that we think would glue that together. Um, we looked at uh, pedestrian crossings, making sure that they're um, safe crossings of streets, particularly at bus stops, um, at um, businesses, uh, make sure those crossings are adequately spaced. So on a certain character of street, are there 
Um, are there crossings at a, as a reasonable distance? Um, we looked at the green loop as part of the Central City 2035 plan and made sure we we're thinking about how can our investments in safer crossings support a future green loop. Um, and then we looked at sort of risk factors like where are there places in our central city where um, there are dual turns where cars can turn from the left lane or the middle lane and uh, that we know that that's a, a risk for pedestrians crossing. And then finally, we looked at sort of um, goods and services, freight, um, particularly in our um, central east side, um, figuring out where the loading zones were, where the loading docks were, where the freight portals were. How can we take all of these four lenses and we kind of funnel them down into these projects, um, um, thinking through uh, piece by piece how we can make, um, make our streets more efficient and safer um, while supporting these multiple goals. Um, so here's just a map from the um, one of the workshops that Kelly mentioned earlier, where um, the jurisdiction in this case was uh, Portland Bureau of Transportation, City of Portland, and TriMet and Metro thinking through, okay, well, where are we wanting to make the bus faster? Where are those orange lines on that map I showed you earlier? And where do they overlap with the blue lines I showed you, those bikeways that we also want to improve? So where do we need to be thinking about if we're, um, reprogramming this road like say southwest madison um, um, where do we need to be thinking about biking and um and transit at the same time um, and then here here's just an example of some of this um, um conceptual design work that we did um in concert and i think it just shows how um the the benefits of really thinking about um uh prioritizing transit and also thinking about making our bike system safer and more reliable at the same time. So this is West Burnside Street here, approaching the bridge. And in red, you'll see streets that we were thinking about, okay, these are places where we want a bus lane or a bus and turn lane. In green, you'll see these are, these are protected bike facilities and blue is parking. And we're just trying to sort of balance it all and lay it all out and make sure that it fits. Um, so the end result of that, um, multiple lenses looking at um, where the most people riding the bus are stuck in traffic, um, where uh, people who are trying to cross the street are um, not finding the safe crossing, where the holes are in our low stress bikeway network, how goods and services get around. We found out we got 18 projects um, that were identified in our central city in motion effort. And here you can see these, this is, this is um, those, those 18 projects, the, the transit elements of those, around our central city boundary and the impact that they have for our regional transportation system. So just because of sort of like the, the hub and spoke nature of um, transit in Portland, these um, congestion points really will benefit transit lines across the region, whether you're, even if you're never riding in downtown Portland, if you're just um, commuting back and forth in Gresham or Beaverton, um, if your bus is stuck in um, the central city, that still is unfortunate. So let's see if we can fix it. Um, okay. So that takes us sort of through the workshops that we talked about with the enhanced transit corridors. It takes us through the passage of this central city in motion plan, which we um, brought to our city council in November of 2018. And now we're gonna sort of shift gears and talk about the implementation of the plan. It's been a really um, uh, exciting opportunity to transition so quickly from the, um, the uh, a planning exercise of coming up with these projects to, okay, well now how do we implement them? And um, We've, um, you know, just one of the benefits of this, of that, um, that early workshop work is we um, built a lot of um, trust and relationships with our uh, colleagues at Metro and TriMet. And we're like, okay, well, let's see if we can move some of these projects very quickly. And Southwest Madison is an example of that. So um, just a short, short segment of um, road, the approach to the Hawthorne Bridge. Um, I'm just gonna show you a little bit more of the pre-work on this project, just so you can kind of see what we were, um, looking at. So this is this is data that TriMet provided to the jurisdictions um, in, in that sort of workshop phase, thinking through, well, where are the problems? And you can see here, this is showing the speed of the line 14 at the PM peak on weekdays. Um, and you can see it's going three to five, five to 10 miles an hour in approach to the Hawthorne Bridge um, itself. So we zoomed in on this section here. Um, we also were able to get the data, and you saw an earlier example of this, of um, so you know stops along the bottom, time of day um, along the left side, 
um, sort of where where is the problem, what time of day is it, um, and which stop. Um, and just this is the sort of the context. This is what the Southwest Madison looked like um, before. Uh, parking on one side for parking enforcement vehicles and Portland police, two travel lanes and a bikeway. And then we worked through different ideas for how to um, how to solve for both a, a, a bridge approach that has lots of vehicles, lots of bikes, and lots of buses. So uh, we looked at a center running bike lane with um, bus lane. Um, we looked at shifting the bikes to the left side and adding a signal, to shift them from left to right. Um, we looked at dropping the bus lane in different sections. And what we landed with is this um, configuration, which we implemented in May, um, of um, two vehicular lanes on the left side, removing the parking along the street, um, and then creating a bus and bike lane where there's a sort of a passing lane for bikes um, and prohibiting right turns at um, Southwest Third. And um, this is this is um, the Monday after we installed the project. Our um, our communications uh, specialist, um, Hannah Schaefer, there talking to the media, explaining um, uh, explaining the new facility. Part of the uh, I'll mention part of the the thinking in this. The designing this project is what what are the elements that we need to get the the bus performance the safety performance um but that we can still deliver it quickly how can we not make it a major capital project that takes a year to design and a year to construct um and um the good news is we've seen some encouraging results the line two is now uh, has 20 percent less delay in the, the evening commute um line 10 12 percent less delay all day and the Live 14 has seen a 60% increase in reliability in this section. Um, so, yay. Um, the, the, the other piece here is, um, you know, uh, and Kelly can maybe speak to this a little bit later, that because of the congestion in the central city, TriMet um, has needed to build in time into their schedules to account for traffic, right? So when we have, when we were able to provide this bypass, um, it's an opportunity for TriMet to look again at their schedules and see if they can tighten them up. Um, our next project will be on Northwest Everett Street. So this is um, an approach to the steel bridge. Um, six bus lines use um, the steel bridge. Five of them are frequent service. Um, let's see, during peak hours, buses run every two to three minutes on Everett Street. Um, and um, this, is, um, this is a rendering of what that project will look like. We're um, uh, converting one of the two vehicular travel lanes on Everett Street from Broadway to the bridge to a bus and turn lane. So um, buses will be able to continue through there um, and um, vehicles are allowed to turn right from that lane or allowed to access the parking on the right side of the street, but not to continue through. Um, this project we will be in construction on August 10th, so very soon. Um, and then the Burnside Bridge. Um, four bus lines use the Burnside Bridge, um, buses running every three to six minutes in the peak hour, almost 20,000 people carry on the corridor and transit every day. Um, and um, we have, in addition to our partnership with TriMet and with Metro, we brought on another partner in this project, um, Multnomah County, who is the road or the, the owner um, of the uh, Burnside Bridge. And we're working to um, get a bus lane striped across the bridge itself from um, Southwest 2nd Avenue. Um, across to MLK um, as a phase one project. And then um, we'll come back in um, 2020, um, uh, maybe cutting into 2021, replacing a traffic signal at MLK and um, Burnside so that we can provide the bus with its own signal and differentiate the bus and cyclists from right turning vehicles and then continue that bus lane out to 12th Avenue or on the east side. This is a look of what, um, Burnside would look like um, facing east at West 2nd Avenue, looking um, down the bridge. And then um, here's the phase two um, showing how the, uh, the look um, going eastbound at MLK. And then here, just sort of zooming out a little bit, putting these uh, projects in context, this is a, sort of another version of that um, map I showed you earlier, just, but just focused on these three projects. Um, showing the lines benefiting from these Madison Everett 
and Burnside Enhanced Transit Corridor Project. What's next? Um, so um, some of the renderings you saw showed um, red pavement markings um, with, um, in partnership with TriMet and Metro, we've uh, um, submitted to the FHWA to request request to the ability to experiment with red pavement markings, so we can use them on um, use them on our road to help provide better guidance for uh, vehicles, so that people people driving know which lane they should be in and which lane they shouldn't. Um, and then uh, you know another thing I might just tell you uh, we talked at the beginning about um, how transportation is forty two percent of our carbon emissions in Oklahoma County, and it's the, it's the one carbon emission um, um, area that's headed in the wrong direction, it's growing. So we're working with um, the American Cities Climate Challenge, um, uh, funded by Uber Philanthropies, to really see if we can use um, behavioral science to um, really get more benefit out of these enhanced transit projects than we uh, use like the transportation demand management strategies and um, Test, test some ways to encourage people to use these things faster, more reliable, and less Any questions? So I have a very simple question. A couple of slides back, you showed a shot of, of uh, Burnside. Was that looking you on one side? Uh, I guess you're looking eastward, right? Or were you looking westward? I think in both cases we're looking east. Okay, yep. so you're looking east then. Okay, so that means that the westward, no, so that the westward side of Burnside, do you hear me? The, the microphone is not really for online, so everybody oh, can hear questions so, online. I'm sorry. Yeah, no so the so the, um, so the current traffic pattern will change to allow uh, westward travel, vehicular travel, into the city along Burnside? Or does this represent the traffic pattern that's there now? Uh, good question. Um, the, um, the Burnside, the, there's a maintenance project on the Burnside Bridge right now. Um, so um, the lane configuration has been changing over the last uh, two years, I'd say. Mm -hmm. um, but when that, uh, maintenance project is complete. Um, there will be two vehicular travel lanes in either direction on the Burnside Bridge, one eastbound bus lane, and um, wider buffered bike lanes in both directions. Okay, so I guess my related question then is, is the, um, the change that was implemented uh, shifting the westward traffic over to Cooch, is that gonna remain or are we gonna switch it back to the Goodwood? <laughs> Uh, no, well, we're not. I, I say it that way, and it sounds facetious, yeah. but the fact is that we have a great view of the city coming down Burnside, now it's gone. Uh, yeah. No, we're not proposing to remove the, the couplet on the east side of the street. Thanks, Yeah. Thank you. Oh. Is it is like pour over coffee. You need it, but is it worth the wait? <laughs> Interesting. There is no wrong answer. That's very creative. And then, David, you have a question. So, for the bus only lane, is it only during certain times of day, or do you get it for all periods? Um, so, the, at least for the three that we talked about today, um, those are all day, all week bus lanes. We do that. Um, Hi, Gabe. Hi. Um, so this is not so much of a question as it is a comment. I just want to acknowledge the work that the um, people at um, the Portland Bus Lane Project did with Southwest Madison and also Better Block um, PDX as well because they really helped to kickstart that whole idea and worked with Peabot and trying to throw them some years to try to get something on the ground. And I think that played a big part in helping to implement this project so quickly on Southwest Madison. I would absolutely agree. Yeah. President Advocate. Yeah. <laughs> So how close is Trimet to the 
Good question. So um, we will introduce articulated buses with the Division Transit Project, which is set to open in 2022. So that will be the first implementation of articulated buses, and the hope is that we will continue to grow um, the use of articulated buses after that as well. Sounds good. I'd be happy to chat with you afterwards exactly. and get you in touch with the right folks. Okay, so I'll take another food suggestion. Yes. I, I like some good coffee because it's something that uh, the U.S. has recently come into appreciating. But I'm going to throw out another one in the same vein of bread. So for a long time, we just insisted on the standard white bread. But in Europe, they've been eating freshly baked parts and bread for a long time. Sure. <laughs> Bear with me for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> because this ranges from small rolls to slices to baguettes to stuff. It was for each community, whether that's a grinder or a hoagie. Um, and perhaps we here in Portland are reinventing things, whether it was France, uh, basically reinventing the hamburger bun as we know it, the standard five inch that they um, that is a fantastic answer. <laughs> I love that. You're winning. I hope, yeah, did you somebody win tweet that? that? <laughs> I hope. question. So the intent of that measure, um, there are a number of problems around when a bus stops to pick up passengers. So sometimes it is, it can take a long time to get back into a travel lane. Um, it could be a potential solution for a long dwell time could be all door boarding. So there's a lot of people getting on and off and it just takes a long time. So dwell is about stopping to pick up passengers and how long it takes to get back in service. Okay. And then we'll go back to the what is transit bus base, well, well, the food, uh, Cooking oil. Cooking oil. Because you can't really do a good meal without some kind of, some kind of uh, lubrication. <laughs> <laughs> Great. But uh, the other thing is we had articulated buses back in the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. And I remember that uh, at the, the first max stops, that's where the articulated bus would pick people up and take them lunch. And then they were in the junkyards. Yes. So what happened? Great question. Um, so we... TriMet is actually the largest agency in the country that does not currently operate articulated buses, just in case you have a trivia game that happens. Um, what happened was that those particular articulated buses uh, were not great, and we had a ton of issues uh, around maintenance and safety. And so uh, we um, phased those out over a period of time, and then quite frankly, it took a long time to talk everyone into the fact that it's not that articulated buses themselves are bad, it was that those particular buses were pretty bad. So we are back at it and we intend to roll them out as part of DTP, but also um, elsewhere in our system. Trains already running some on their uh, express line. Oh, they are? Oh, okay. Sorry. I mean, not to mention the lines. Right, but I just, I, I've seen them, but I remember it was a, it was a fun drive though, because you had to do some lights. Yeah. <laughs> Question about uh, transit priority. Give us some examples. Recently, I'm curious about the experience on the streetcar in Grand, where the right hand lane that the streetcar travels in has been changed to be right turn only. I saw a lot of non compliance. Wondering if you have experience with that and did it really help the streetcar? Uh, great question. And I'm afraid I don't really have the answer for that. I am aware of that project, but I haven't seen any of the post data. And I, I have heard that there's been some. Uh, 
thanks again. I guess it's, uh, it's a little bit of a question about um, related to the articulated bus question. Mm -hmm. And it's also related to my previous comment. Sure. If you would. Of course. Uh, I guess, first of all, thanks a lot for all of your work. Oh. You guys are great making making the buses and the, and the bikes and the, and the uh, cars work well together. Good effort, especially on the mass and the off road. Um, when we had the articulated buses before, uh, the intersection 23rd, Northwest 23rd, and Vista, and Burnside mm -hmm. used to have that restaurant there, Henry Peely's, mm -hmm. and we happened to live there, around there. And what happened was that that intersection greatly increased in size because I think that the bus needed a greater turning radius. Uh, and so I guess this is an aspect of comment. I think that that we should be really cautious about changing the city in order to accommodate bus turns. It's a mistake that was made uh, by Robert Moses in New York and fought against by Jane Jacobs and others by changing the surface of the earth in order to, to accommodate transportation. So good job, guys. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Hopefully public transit is like tofu because there's more protein than bacon, but you just have to work harder to eat less food, even if it's good. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty good. And also, maybe if you can talk more about that in your alliance, you can talk more here than in your like how that works. I can give you sort of a preview. Um, we are just um, starting that work. So we're working with a consultant firm called Ideas 42, which is their specialty of benefit of science. Um, and the question that we asked them to help us figure out is um, really the question of this presentation how do we get um, more people in a growing central city to choose to use transit? What are some, of, what are some ways that we can make that um, uh, change, change that behavior? And so they haven't, they're, they're, they're formulated the question, they've been out here and done some interviews and some, uh, um, we've seen things on the ground, but we haven't, um, they haven't, we haven't tested anything yet. To, to uh, does Parliament have any electric buses and are still how many still planned for transition to electric buses? Great question. Yes, we do have a few electric buses on property. Um, and we are also growing our fleet. So we um, received a grant for five additional buses, and then we just received another grant. Um, from the Federal Transit Administration for even more buses. We developed a plan um, for uh, transitioning our fleet. Um, it obviously is going to take some time. I'd be happy to share that document with you, but um, as you know, uh, electric technology is moving quickly and um, we are continuing to look to peer agencies that have uh, even larger fleets than we currently have um, uh, on property. And our intent is to um, have that all go really well and to continue to invest in electric technology. But of course, we need to sort of see how it all plays out. We have a 2040 plan for our system, which I'd be happy to share. But once again, it's sort of contingent on making sure that the existing um, uh, fleet types work for our system. I had a question from one of the online viewers. Does the region see opportunities for bus on shoulder transit operations on any of the freeways? Great question. So we, uh, this is one of the tools in the toolbox and it's certainly something that our friends to the north in Vancouver have um, spent a lot of time looking at. Um, we continue to have conversations with our friends at the Oregon Department of Transportation and uh, we're hopeful that that is something that we could see in the future. Bus on shoulder. So there are a number of regions in the country that actually operate their buses on the shoulder of the highway. So it all started in um, Minnesota and Minneapolis sort of on accident. They just started operating on the shoulder without having um, the rules in place. And it was really wonderful for transit because transit could just move while there were standing queues of cars. So now they have entire systems that are in, in Minneapolis and other cities that are built with the intent of operating transit vehicles on the shoulder of the road. Of course, the shoulder needs to be 
large enough and stable enough for that to occur, which is not true everywhere, but there are potentially some opportunities. I was, um, I imagine that removal of parking is a, kind of a core challenge in, in projects related. Correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I um, I was really impressed that uh, that, that you were able to get the police to about that lane of parking on Madison. And I guess I'm just curious, um, it, you know, can you comment on that a little bit? And do you think that that's um, that's sort of seen as a challenge for these projects? Like, is there more political will to remove parking in some of these problem areas, or um, I'd certainly challenge. Um, and so, you know, like particularly to Southwest Madison, I think one of the, um, the that, um, um, you know, removing our own parking enforcement vehicle parking, that's something that was um, not, not too hard to do, uh, but, um, you know, working with our partners at the Central Precinct um, took some work. Um, and, um, one of the you know one of the advantages of our of doing this sort of holistic look and thinking about transit and cycling and everything together is we were able to identify um, okay this is a, this is a street where we're really like Everett for example the street we're prioritizing as a transit approach for the steel bridge um, and what's the how do we how do we um, what's the how do we fit that in what's the what's the right trade off in that case um, based on the traffic analysis we did um, the neighbor, context of the neighborhood. It was converting a travel lane to the bus lane. Um, in other cases, um, it's parking that is needs to give. And um, but we, we were able to identify sort of all of that across the whole central city. Um, and so there's about a thousand spaces that are impacted if we implement all 18 projects um, as we intend. Um, but at least we're we're able to, you know, there's hopefully there's there's less surprises. It's still, you know, there's as we get into the implementation, um, you know, it's one thing to be talking with mobility folks like about the you know the potential impacts and then it's another to go door to door to business and say hey this is the change that we're going to be implementing on the street. Yeah I would say from my perspective as well that it's one of the really big pluses of using a really data-driven program and that um, they are difficult conversations and I feel like most difficult conversations are about parking but if we're able to more clearly articulate the issue and the solution then at least we have some common space to talk in. Um, I think what is most difficult for people is when things seem arbitrary. And so for me, it's just been really helpful to have that data. Even if you disagree and you don't like the outcome, at least we can agree on the information. So I'm just wondering about enforcement. You're significantly expanding the mileage of, of lanes that you're trying to manage. How is that going to work? And like I see Lyft and Uber drivers using it in the, the downtown transit hall a lot. Wondering about that. And then I have a quick uh, food offering. Um, transit is like candy walnuts. I'm just eating the kale to get to the candy walnuts. <laughs> and the candy walnuts are not that good for you. And they're good for you at the same time. So transit is like good for you to take, but sometimes it's slow. So hey. yeah. <laughs> I like that. That's very good. I feel like that was sponsored by Trader Joe's. <laughs> yes. um, so do you want to talk about enforcement or? Um, sure. I think um, what's it? I guess you know our experience on the, the Madison project, at least. Um, um, the um, experience on the Madison project is actually compliance with the um, well, folks not driving in the bus lane has been very good, um, and where we've had challenges is um, uh, making sure that um, drivers. Um, adhere to the right turn restriction that we've signed in several ways. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, I, I think for like the transit mall, for example, I, I think most uh, most of the what I what I've seen out there is we it would be good to provide more um, direction and guidance to, uh, to drivers and particularly for folks who are turning on to the transit mall to give them clear indication of which lane they need to be in. And that's one of the things we're excited about with the um, red pavement markings is we think that will really help people um, land in the right spot. Um, as um, you know, it's, 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 if our city continues to grow as we expect, and um, our 
these transit lanes work as well as we hope they will and congestion continues to grow, we, you know, we may need to use um, additional methods. But yeah. One of the big pluses about the red lane program is that it is still a pilot for FHWA. And so we are required to identify what we think the outcome will be of using red paint. We're hiring PSU to do some of those measures. And so it'll be nice to have data to quantify some of those potential issues and then address them more specifically. Um, but I think we'll learn a lot from that data gather, gathering um, opportunity. Yeah, thank you. It's you know it ties right in with uh, a maintenance consideration, which is you know a lot of paint to maintain. Our intent is to um, at least in this pilot experimental phase, what we uh, suggest we'll do is uh, paint the, the sort of the top of the block. So as you as the um, just past the crosswalk, there would be a box of red, um, and then would and then would just use black or white lines. So that would be less. Another online question. Um, as TNCs like Uber and Lyft become more popular, one, what is the impact on bus ridership? And two, are you planning for places TNCs cannot go to help transit compete? The first question um, I can answer. I think the second question is a jurisdiction question. So, um, there is a proliferation of TNCs, and um, we have done a lot of um, data gathering in order to understand a little bit about our ridership in general. Um, there are lots of factors that go into ridership, as you all know, and so one of those things is uh, choices. And so as a native Portlander, I feel like we never really used to have a choice with cabs because you never knew if they would actually show up. And so now we have this online resource that you know exactly when it's gonna come, and it's lots of fun. So at least anecdotally, um, in particular on the off-peak, there is some erosion of ridership that can be correlated to TNCs. And so that is part of, um, you know, there's many reasons for us to be investing in transit speed and reliability, but part of it is that we need to better compete with um, those types of services. Um, so can that is- for the Oh, sorry, yes. Transportation Oop. network companies. Yeah. Yes. And then in terms of are you planning for places TNCs cannot go to help transit compete? That is not a conversation that I have had. Um, that would, it seems like a jurisdiction would have some say over that, but it's, I've not been involved in conversations around that. Um, I also would like to submit in keeping with the theme of hipster food, that transit is avocado. Oh. <laughs> because it's, it's kind of green and healthy, less so than kale, but more so than bacon. Nice. <laughs> I like it. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you all.